Um, welcome everyone to day three of our forest landowner webinar series. We'll here today we'll be talking about invasive species. We have Chris Evans and Kevin Rowling uh, to talk about this topic and they are from the University of Illinois uh, Extension Forestry. Um, and a special thanks goes out to the Illinois Forestry Development Council for making this project possible by funding it. All right, thank you, Zach. Um, welcome everybody, as Zach said, uh, to this talk on invasive species. Um, my part is the, is the first half of this presentation and I'm gonna be talking about identification of, of common forest invaders. And then really this is going to be, uh, this whole presentation is aimed at forest landowners. So you'll see during the presentation that that's the angle that we take. We talk kind of how they impact forest, how they impact private landowners and, and forest management in general. So I broke the presentation into three major parts. And I'll start with just a little bit about the problem of invasive species and why uh, private landowners, forest landowners should be concerned with invasive species and why they um, should incorporate management of invasives into their normal forest management. Um, I'll talk about the uh, unique situations when we do forest management uh, and have to deal with invasive plants and then spend most of the time at the end talking about what are some of the common forest invaders that we deal with here uh, in Illinois. So what is an invasive species? We, we hear that term a lot, um, so I do like to always start these out with a bit of a technical definition in terms of uh, exactly what I'm talking about when I say an invasive species. And to me, uh, they, these are species that are not native to an ecosystem. They, are, they were not naturally found there. They did not naturally migrate on their own. They were, uh, we call them exotic species from somewhere else, and they were introduced those introduced species then had the ability to escape, uh, reproduce on their own, and then eventually form um, self-sustaining na naturalized populations that kind of take care of themselves. And then those naturalized populations have to build a certain level um, to cause some disruption, some negative consequences of them being on the landscape. And to me, that's the real kicker with, uh, in terms of what an invasive species is is that it, it, it's an exotic species that causes damage. It's a disruption. It could be to ecological damage, economic damage, environmental damage. There's some negative impact uh, as a consequence of that species now being on the landscape. Um, and so those are what we're, we're concerned about. And, um, you know, in honesty, uh, in all honesty, we do have a checkered past, if you look at, um, the history of our use of invasive species. And this goes all the way back, um, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago when we really uh, promoted a lot of what are now our worst invasives. We encouraged people to plant them, had programs out there. And then, um, you know, in defense of, of the folks at that time, um, there wasn't that realization that these species were gonna become problems. It was in an attempt to bring the benefits of those species, the, the, the wildlife benefits, soil holding benefits, whatever the good aspects of those species are over to enhance our land here without understanding that along with the positive benefits come a whole host of negative benefits that usually largely outweigh those positive benefits. So we're dealing with species in our forest now like autumn olive um, that uh, came here uh, intentionally, many of these, um, uh, for a purpose, right? And a couple more of those, you know, Cerecia lespediza for erosion control, multiflora rose for agriculture. Again, we have a checkered past with some of these invasives. But now these and, and many others are out on the landscape and in our forest. And so we have situations where these exotic invasives now are pervasive or, or common throughout our forest and can be found, um, many of them growing together, insights impacting, um, impacting the natives that we, we value. And so this is why we, we are concerned about these invasives. You know, uh, invasive species in general now are becoming universally recognized as a big issue. Uh, 
Um, just in the uh, the U.S. alone, they're considered one of the four major threats to our, our forest and grasslands in this country, uh, right up there with climate change and habitat loss. Um, a little more specific in Illinois, our Illinois Forest Action Plan lists uh, dealing with forest health issues, including invasive species, as one of the seven major threats to our um, Illinois forest lands and our Illinois forest resources. And then our Illinois Wildlife Action Plan, which deals with our rare and declining wildlife species, uh, it also considers dealing with invasive species one of the six primary challenges to conserving our rare and declining wildlife. So really, uh, if you're dealing with conservation, natural resources in any way, whether you're a private landowner or um, a public land manager, uh, invasive species are going to be an issue. And then looking at invasive plants in general, um, why are we concerned about those since that's the topic of today? We're finding that populations of these invasive plants in our forest uh, have often broad reaching impacts. Um, they've been shown to outcompete other species, our native species, and that reduces the diversity of our forest. Um, they can compete with some of our native species and produce uh, decreased productivity. And that could be forage productivity or timber productivity, uh, many other ways to, to, to record that. Uh, they can reduce the quality of wildlife habitat or forage on our property. And then dealing with these and the necessity of trying to manage these can often drastically increase uh, the cost involved with management. And then some are so uh, pervasive and, and so aggressive at forming these big infestations that it can literally restrict access and, and use of our land. And, and I'm sure if any of you out there try to walk through a big stand of multi-floor rows, you know exactly what I mean with that. So just some examples to kind of further hit that point of the negative impacts of these invasives. Uh, garlic mustard is one we're going to talk a lot about uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, but it is an understory plant that's largely unpalatable, almost nothing in terms of our wildlife eat it. And as it moves in and, and starts taking over the understory, it by and large replaces uh, the other species that are food sources for our, our native species. And so you see a drastic drop in forage quantity and habitat quality um, for our wildlife when you get uh, an invasion of, of garlic mustard. And then, as I mentioned with multiflor rose, this is autumn olive here, but again, these dense thickets can restrict access to wildlife, to people using the land, and they can literally change what you can and can't do with your land and how you use your land um, when they get in there. And then others like bush honeysuckle uh, cast so much shade that they can restrict plant growth underneath them. This is a little infestation of bush honeysuckle and you can see underneath of it, um, there's nothing growing, right? It's just dirt, right? So that really can drastically impact um, the quality uh, and the diversity in our forest. Others are just tree killers like Oriental Bittersweet can grow over and completely overwhelm trees. So there's a lot of uh, ways that different invasives can impact our, our forest and which is why we're going to talk at the end when Kevin gets on about how to manage these to, to mitigate these negative impacts. Just a little bit more kind of about the ecology and, and um, specific to forest. Uh, invasive species often, many of these invasive plants respond positively to disturbance. And what I mean with that is that their populations increase, their growth increases in areas that have some level of disturbance. Um, many times you'll see rapid spread following disturbance. They, um, invasives often do well in environments that have uh, a lot of bare soil, a lot of high light, uh, available nutrients um, and resources for them to take advantage of. Those are the situations where you see a lot of invasives first, which is why oftentimes in a forest, invasive species will start uh, along the edge of the forest where there is a lot of light or disturbance or along a road or a path, and then move from there further into the forest because they're taking advantage of that, that high light, taking advantage of that disturbance. And when you're looking at um, invasive plants in forest, forest management particularly, um, these invasive species um, 
deal, uh, force, sorry, forest management equals disturbance in our systems here in um, the central hardwoods and throughout Illinois. Most of our forest here are oak hickory dominated forest and oak hickory forest management typically involves the addition of some different levels of disturbance to promote um, the species that we want to promote. So we're adding disturbance onto the landscape intentionally. And that's a good thing. We need disturbance to maintain our systems. So, and if you, you, you attended the talks yesterday or the day before, um, this is, uh, you know, you've heard this before, but a lot of our forests now are suffering from being undisturbed from a little too long and they're switching over to a different suite of species, like in this shot where there's a lot of maple in there. So we're managing these forests in ways that provide opportunities for more light to get to the understory for um, for bare soil to get there because a lot of the plants that we value need these kind of management practices and need this disturbance on the landscape. So our forest management that we're doing on the landscape involves uh, disturbing the soil. So the fire uh, that we put on the landscape can reduce that duff layer, that leaf layer. Uh, fire breaks, kept just swaths of disturbed soil. It increases light through canopy gaps, through removing that mid-story, uh, damaging existing vegetation. And then we often see a flush of nutrients uh, following fire, following a harvest in our systems. And we're bringing in offsite material, bringing in offsite equipment into our forest. And so this just, um, again, this is a natural part of our forest management. This is how we use, uh, how we manage our forest to maintain the species that we want is through this level of disturbance um, in there. The issue comes that um, this level of disturbance, again, is a good thing. We do this to promote the native species and the flush of natives that we, we want on the landscape like you see in this understory here. Um, the, the big issue comes in that the same management that we do for our forest management to keep them healthy can uh, elicit a positive response from those invasive species as well. So for example, um, this is a little oak species right here. You can see there was some thinning of other species, a little maples and ash, a little oaks growing up in the middle. But if you see around the edge of it, there's also honeysuckle in there. So you're going to have to deal with uh, the positive response from invasives at the same time as dealing with the positive response from the good species as well. Just another example of that, this is uh, Japanese stiltgrass that was responding to canopy damage from an ice storm and really took off after that extra light kind of came into the landscape. And then another shot of that, just this is bush honeysuckle after some wind storms came through and opened the canopy up in the site. Pretty much everything green you see in the center of that picture is uh, bush honeysuckle or Japanese honeysuckle. So many of these invasives uh, can hang around for a while and they behave differently in the seed bank. Luckily, some of the uh, fleshy fruited ones will have fairly short lived seed banks, but others, uh, Cerecia lespediza and the thistles and, and multiflora rose. Uh, can have quite long lived seed banks. And so that's something that we have to deal with when we're thinking about these species and they get established on the landscape. We have to deal with them for often a long time. So let's get into what actually are um, the plants that were the common plants that are impacting forest and, and forest management throughout Illinois. Um, I'll start with our young forest or young tree plantings. Those are, um, those are forests that often have high resource availability since they're newly planted. They'll have a lot of light, a lot of nutrients on, um, available. And with these situations, a lot of times it's the fast growing invasive species, uh, the ones that can compete well with these developing tree seedlings and tree saplings are the ones that we're, we're worried about. So for example, you know, this is Japanese honeysuckle in a mature forest. It may be found in the understory, but it often, unless there's some disturbance, it's just going to stay there. But in a highlight environment, um, like a young tree planting, it can be a real an issue. So in this shot here, you can see we have a tree on the left side, a young tree, a young tree, a couple young trees in the middle, and then another young oak planted here on the right side. Um, and there, all those trees are just going to be overwhelmed um, by the, the Japanese honeysuckle that's in there. 
Um, another one, Autumn Olive here, this is a tree planting or a site that was scheduled for tree planting and all that gray color that you see um, throughout this, this field is all Autumn Olive that just came in and, and overwhelmed the tree planting. So there's a, a number of invaders of young forest out there, and uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them just because it could take us a couple days to hit all of the invasives in Illinois, but I'll highlight two of these uh, invaders of young forest. The first I wanted to talk about is autumn olive. And so autumn olive is pretty common throughout most of the state, um, fairly shade intolerant. So it likes uh, some sunlight or, um, an open forest situation, perfect for that tree planting. This is one that um, you'll you'll find in, in open areas, you'll find in disturbed areas. Uh, it is a nitrogen fixer, so it has the ability to move it even into poor soil sites. If you're unfamiliar with it, it is a multi-stem shrub, dark uh, gray, smooth bark, with the silvery, gray, green, silvery leaves, um, and then the the really fragrant four petaled white flowers in the spring that give way to these um, abundant berries that are kind of rusty red in color and often have little dots on them. So this one again can grow in some shade, but um, you're going to find it typically either in open forest, young tree plantings, old fields and these sites like that and very common throughout the state. One that is probably a little less known as being a major invader is our collary pear. So you probably know collary pear better um, by its cultivar, Bradford pear, or one of the other many cultivars of flowering pears. This is an ornamental plant that's rapidly becoming one of our major invasive species in open lands and, and young forest and open forest uh, throughout the state. It looks a lot different than its, its cultivated um, uh, version, so the, the Bradford pear, which is the big teardrop shaped tree with the uh, big glossy leaves. So this one that reverts and it spreads into the wild and you get escapes, it'll be more multi-stemmed. Uh, they will often will be very thorny. The leaves will actually be a little smaller and a little lighter in color. And then the whole plant takes more of a shrubby look to it. And again, this has been found now pretty much in every uh, county in the state. Uh, if you go around in, in March, uh, late February through through March, depending on where you're at, and you see a lot of white flowering small trees uh, in open areas across the state, you're looking at these collar repairs. Again, rapidly becoming an issue. A lot of people kind of first thought it would just be um, a species that's, that's restricted to kind of roadsides and really highly disturbed sites. But what we're finding now is that it's becoming a major issue in tree plantings. So it moves in, it has bird dispersed seeds so it can get in pretty quickly and then it can just overwhelm our planted trees. And so they're really becoming an issue in tree plantings right now. So just moving into the mature forest. Um, so in a mature forest situation, this is going to have typically lower light availability in the understory. Um, so you're going to find invaders that have a higher level of shade tolerance, can handle those lower light environments, or you're going to have um, invaders that are trees or climbing vines, have the ability to climb up or, or get high enough to reach that available light. The other thing you'll find is with, again, with forest management that, that creates those opportunities, that disturbance for invasion, a lot of our mature forest invaders are ones that have effective dispersal mechanisms that can move in and spread quickly to take advantage of that disturbance on the landscape. So that would be uh, wind dispersed or water dispersed seeds, or many of them have bird dispersed seeds as well, so they can basically spread around quickly. Again, so either shade tolerance, uh, and this is Japanese stiltgrass, uh, the ability to move quickly, such as uh, waterborne seeds and water spread seeds or something like uh, oriental bittersweet which can really climb up in the overstory and um, get a lot of light that way. There is a bunch of different uh, invaders of mature forest and again we could spend here we could spend hours just talking about all the different invaders of mature forest. Uh, here's a quick list I put. I'm going to talk about six of these very quickly. Um, just because I think those are some of the common ones and ones that are definitely worth 
uh, everybody being more familiar with. To me, the, the bush honeysuckles, and there's several species, though this one, the Mackii, is definitely the most common across the state. Uh, the bush honeysuckles, are, to me, are the most damaging, uh, most impactful invasive plant we have in, in Illinois in terms of our forest. Um, found across the state, uh, really, really impactful both to disturbed um, forest, but also even kind of closed canopy, mature forest. Um, this has a high level of shade tolerance, can move through. We found that it has the ability to decrease the growth of trees, eliminate tree seedlings, uh, really impact a lot of our wildlife species, a lot of our native plants in the, in the understory as well. So it's, uh, it really does a lot of, of impacts, which is why I, I consider it the number one issue with invasives in Illinois. If you're not familiar with bush honeysuckle, um, it has opposite leaves in the spring. It, they'll have uh, flowers that aren't as fragrant as the, um, the Japanese, the viney honeysuckle, but still has some fragrance. Those flowers will typically be white giving way to yellow, but a couple of the species will have pinkish, almost red flowers at times. And then they'll have um, bright red to bright orange berries on them. And all of these are multi-stem shrubs that get up to 12 to 15 feet tall normally have a real strong arching nature where the ends of the branches deflex back down towards the ground. And so you'll see situations like this, again, where it form these really heavy infestations, dense infestations. It can grow at, at high densities uh, when they're small shrubs or just they can form huge shrubs that have big canopies uh, that just shade everything out underneath it. Uh, the second is uh, our buckthorn. So there's common and glossy buckthorn. And these are an issue in the northern third to maybe northern half of the state, uh, but a really big issue. As bad up there as honeysuckle is across the rest of the state. Um, they are a little different between the two. The glossy buckthorn typically is a little wetter environments, whereas the common buckthorn, which is the one on the left, um, can grow all the way from wet to really dry environments. Um, they have opposite to kind of semi-opposite leaves and then especially the common buckthorn will have a little thorn at the end of a branch that you can see. Uh, it'll have these leaves that almost look like dogwood leaves with the real arching veins on it. Um, and then it'll have the purple berries. And you can see it'll form these big thickets as well and big dense stands. Again, as bad as anything is, um, invasive wives in the northern parts of the state. It's really a big issue. Now on the southern part of the state, um, moving north, we have Japanese stiltgrass. I would say it's found in the southern half of the state, um, southern third of the state very, very commonly, but it's moving farther north. It's even been found almost on the, all the way up to close to the Wisconsin line. So it can definitely grow throughout Illinois. But it's an interesting one where it's a little annual warm season grass, but it likes growing in the understory. Um, forms these really, really dense mats. If you think it may be Japanese stilt grass and it, you see this small grass with little short fat leaves, um, it is an annual, so it'll pull up very easily. So if you grab it and give a little tug, it should come out of the ground very easily. Most of the lookalike grasses are gonna be perennials. And so they'll have a better root system and they won't really pop out of the ground. But again, you can see uh, just dense stands of it uh, really can displace and keep everything else out. Uh, tree of heaven is one that typically grows kind of at the edge of a forest, but we're seeing it move into canopy gaps, definitely. Um, it is a true tree, very common throughout many places in the state. Um, it looks a little bit like uh, a big sumac or even some people mistake it for a black walnut. The best way to tell it apart is the smell. So it smells like rotten peanut butter uh, or just a generally bad smell if you crush a leaf and smell it. Also, you can look at each of the leaflets. So that's each, in, each individual one of these are a leaflet with the whole thing being a leaf. And each leaflet at the base is gonna have these little notches. And if you flip these notches over, you'll see a little gland right there. And that's a good way to tell it. They do have uh, winged fruit that will uh, be wind dispersed and then pretty tight uh, light gray bark as well. 
This one's interesting in that it is a clonal species, so it'll form these big stands that are all connected underground, which makes controlling it often very difficult. Um, two more that I'll mention. Uh, garlic mustard is well known. Uh, it's one that is found throughout the state, is a major target for spring garlic mustard pool work days for volunteers. Um, another one that is really impactful to our spring wildflowers because it grows at the same time in the same habitat. It is a biennial, so it has two life stages. The first year is going to look like what you see on the left. Uh, the second year is going to form a flowering uh, plant that's going to be pretty tall, two to four or five feet tall at times, with the little white flowers that you see on the right. And then that gives way to these tall uh, spikes with all these little seed pods on it. Um, the plant smells like garlic, so if you think it's garlic mustard, you could crush it up and smell it, and it's going to smell strongly of garlic. It is actually edible, which is why it got introduced into the United States uh, in the first place. But it, um, again, very, very damaging. It's allelopathic, so it can exude chemicals out of its roots that'll slow the growth of other plants to give it a competitive advantage. And then lastly, um, oriental bittersweet. This is one that's really, really damaging to trees in areas where it's found. And it's found scattered throughout the state. It's not ubiquitous, but there's definitely pockets of it. Um, it can impact trees in a couple ways. One, by simply wrapping around them tightly like you see in that picture on the left, uh, and then literally girdling those trees and killing them that way. Or it can just get into the canopy and add so much extra weight to those trees it can uh, pull those branches down, break those branches, or make the trees more susceptible to wind throw or ice damage. Uh, it is important to note that we do have a native bittersweet that doesn't typically form big infestations. You usually see just one or two vines at a time. They do look similar. The easiest way to tell them apart uh, would be by the fruit. So this is oriental bittersweet and it has a lot of fruit on it that are found all along the vine. So everywhere there's kind of axles, you'll find little clusters of fruit. Uh, the fruit are a little small and have that kind of yellowy orange fruit covering that you see in the picture. Our native uh, American bittersweet will have fruit that's really only at the end of the vine. So they're in these little terminal clusters only at the end of the vine. The fruit are a little larger and they have a dark orange fruit covering. So once you see them enough, you can really tell, the, tell them apart. Um, but if you're unfamiliar, sometimes it can be kind of tough. But again, this one um, wraps around the trees, can form vines. The biggest vine I think I've seen has been right at about five inches in diameter. Um, but typically you'll see it smaller. It's another clonal species. So oftentimes it's connected underground, a big network of roots underground. And then it also can run along the ground as that vine grows and then root in multiple places, making it even that much harder to control. Um, again, we could go over many, many uh, different invasives. I really wanted to highlight the ones that I think are most impactful to private lands, uh, private forest landowners. So to wrap up my section of this presentation, uh, these invasive plants are a serious issue for forest and for private forest landowners across the state. Um, our forest management practices that we need to maintain a healthy forest also have the potential to encourage invasives. Um, and there's invas different invasives that impact our young forest and some that impact our older forest. But in general, um, knowing what these species are and then acting upon them and managing them to reduce those negative impacts is a highly needed in uh, our forest, whether it's private or public forest in the state. And with that, I'm going to let Kevin jump into the second part of this presentation and talk about actually managing these species. All right, thanks, Chris. And hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I'm Kevin Rowling, Forestry Research Technician with U of I Extension Forestry, working out of the Dixon Springs Ag Center in Southern Illinois. 
So knowing how important it is to manage the forest and uh, consequently manage the invasive species that could become a problem after management, we're going to go through a few different uh, strategies, some techniques, and then some safety considerations when you're working on invasive plant control. Oops. Oh my. <laughs> Went a little fast there. Um, so just a brief outline here. Um, I already mentioned we're going to do some strategy techniques, including cultural, physical, biological, and chemical control options. Uh, we're going to go over some herbicide considerations and along with that some safety factors. And then I'm going to close out with some more information for anyone who uh, wants to dive a little deeper into this topic. And I threw in this picture here. Uh, this is an area where on the left you had a private landowner who has done a really excellent job of controlling bush honeysuckle in his understory and uh, an adjacent uh, public land site where they haven't been able to get to um, performing some control and that kind of highlights one of the challenges of invasive species control when you have a seed source that is not necessarily under your uh, control uh, can always come back onto your land so it could be a, an ongoing challenge to uh, manage for these uh, invasive plants. So to start out with some sort of general uh, guidelines, uh, if you know you have a population of an invasive plant, um, one idea is that you want to sort of focus on the outlier um, instances or occurrences of these invasive populations first so that they don't uh, set seed in sort of a new area and become a more established core population. So if you look at this uh, graphic here and you imagine that the uh, cluster, larger cluster of, of dots there is the core infestation and then you have those outliers there. You want to work on those outliers first and then slowly kind of work from the edge into the core infestation and eventually your, your hope is to eliminate as much of those as possible. Um, but uh, knowing that the core area is likely to be a problem for some time to come requiring follow-up treatments, but if you get to some of those outliers that may squash them uh, and they may not be an issue going forward. Another uh, thing you can use to your advantage is uh, using plant phenology. So the different life stages of different species are going to make a plant either more or less vulnerable to your uh, control that you're trying to implement. So a good example of that might be Japanese stiltgrass. Uh, Chris mentioned earlier it was a it's an annual grass, so um, basically its life cycle is completed in a single year. So if you're able to go in to a site and uh, conduct your control towards the end of that growing season, uh, it's unlikely for that plant to set new seed. So that is one plant where you can use um, like a string trimmer or some other mechanical control if you time it right at the end of the growing season and it won't have enough time to uh, grow back to the flower and, and set seed. Uh, another sort of different example might be uh, treatment of uh, Tree of Heaven. So on larger Tree of Heavens, um, it's um, recommended to perform a hack and squirt or a stem injection treatment while it is actively growing. So sometime uh, towards the end of the summer is usually uh, when it's re recommended to do that treatment. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that method uh, a little later, but that's just a couple of examples. So when you're thinking about uh, controlling invasive plants on a site, 
it's really best to think about all of the tools in your toolbox, all of the options that are available to you. And uh, land managers sort of um, came up with this hierarchy of uh, integrated pest management where you're using all of the different types of control um, to come up with the best possible solution, most likely for uh, successful management of invasives. So those are these cultural, physical, biological, and chemical controls that oftentimes you use in conjunction with one another uh, to have the best result. So an example of a cultural control is uh, active prevention. So uh, minimizing disturbance, as Chris mentioned, this can conflict with our other forest management objectives. Think about the timing of your work. Um, in the north, I know it's more possible to work uh, when the ground is frozen. Um, in southern Illinois, that's uh, frequently not possible, especially in recent years. But you can do it, uh, do management at times where you're less likely to um, have a, a greater uh, impact on soil disturbance, for example. You can avoid traveling through areas where seed is set. So um, a good example of uh, how invasive seeds spread through that mechanism is the Japanese chaff flower. And that's what we have pictured here on the right. The top image is a real close up picture of um, the Japanese chaff flower seed. And you can see on each one of those seeds, there's those two little barbs. And what happens is those two little barbs uh, get caught up in, in animal fur, such as the dog below. Uh, those are some chaff flower seeds uh, in that image or on your um, clothing or your boot laces. It, it really clings and then uh, you walk into a different area, it falls off and, and you got a new population. And that's not just true for species like chaff flower that kind of cling, but even um, smaller seeded uh, species like uh, garlic mustard, for example, might get caught up in some mud, maybe get into your boot tread or uh, equipment tires. And uh, if you don't clean those things off um, before moving into different areas, that's going to be another uh, source. So that's something you can do uh, to prevent uh, the spread. Um, and just generally is uh, another cultural sort of control is managing for resiliency. So conducting your um, forest management responsibly, uh, trying to maintain intact natural communities. The more intact your uh, uh, communities are, the, the more uh, those areas are able to resist invasion. Um, Another uh, way to do this is to widen buffer zones, um, reduce roads and trails if it's possible. Those are frequently sources of introduction and spread. And, you know, like Chris said, uh, some of our disturbance regimes that are uh, beneficial uh, for native natural communities also are going to uh, benefit some invasives. So we just need to be prepared for that and um, do uh, pre-control and post-control follow-up management and uh, um, make sure to take care of those as soon as possible uh, to prevent the explosion of those populations. So uh, prescribed fire is actually also considered uh, cultural control as well. And uh, people often cite fire as a way to uh, control invasives, and that can largely be true, but um, it's important to realize that there are species that increase and some that decrease following fire. And even the increasers, though, can be coupled with uh, other forms of control and um, lead to a more rapid reduction in those species. If you couple, for example, 
uh, prescribed fire in an area that's invaded by Japanese stiltgrass and uh, follow-up controls, either mechanical or chemical, to treat that flush of um, new growth, you can actually deplete the seed bank um, more rapidly. So that's a, sort of an example of that integrated pest management where you're using multiple treatment options kind of at the same time uh, to have uh, the, the greatest success. Um, so there's a few different uh, increasers and decreasers following fire. One that I've seen uh, that has mixed results and I've seen it kind of go both ways and I'm, I'm really not sure why <laughs> is garlic mustard. Um, I've seen instances where um, we've had a site where we ran fire through an area and garlic mustard uh, was nearly eliminated with the exception of areas that had uh, remained unburned, so kind of behind wet logs or something where fire may have not gotten uh, around those wet logs um, to uh, burn up those rosettes, for example. Um, so I've, I've seen it go both ways for that one, um, so you just got to be prepared to um, uh, address that if it if it goes either way. Um, so the impact, the overall impact of fire on invasives can, can vary quite a bit, even with those decreasers, uh, which are largely the woody species. Um, in general, we have a couple exceptions there with Oriental Bittersweet and Tree of Heaven, but um, depending on the intensity and the timing, I've seen uh, burns where uh, fire basically has moved around the outside of uh, more established autumn olive uh, plants, for example, because basically if you've ever seen a, a, a large older autumn olive, uh, there's really not a whole lot growing underneath it. It's too shaded out and then the leaves that it may have dropped have basically disintegrated um, pretty rapidly. So there's nothing really to carry a fire underneath those. But on the other hand, if you do have uh, sort of a younger autumn olive, such as this one pictured on the right, that has some herbaceous layer or a greater amount of leaf litter that can carry the fire, so that individual would most likely be top killed and re-sprout. And again, this would be a case where you would want to come in and do perhaps a follow-up chemical treatment on that re-sprout. So instead of, like, say, you're um, doing a foliar spray of this larger shrub, um, after the plant re-sprouts, gets to be a couple feet tall, you can come in and do a foliar spray on that much smaller surface area, and you're um, likely to have less impact overall uh, with your chemical application. So another good idea to, um, to get started is to just really kind of have a knowledge of your site and come up with a, a plan. You can later adjust your plan if you see things change or if something's not working, but it really helps to have a strategy and um, kind of uh, come up with the, the best uh, plan for success. So. These are just some examples of what you might want to consider when you're coming up with a plan to address invasives. Uh, what's the overall condition? Um, what's the site history? Are there areas that are more disturbed than others? Are there areas that are have more intact natural areas where there might be fewer invaders? Uh, which, which invasives do you have? So uh, management of one species, uh, recommendations for one species might contradict management recommendations for another, so it's important to know uh, what you have. What are the potential pathways, roads, trails, like I mentioned earlier? Um, some of the greatest threats. And to set realistic goals uh, for your property. Um, in some cases, you might have um, an area 
that is, let's say you have a, a stream running through your property and upstream of your site, you might have an area where the adjacent landowner is not controlling, let's say Japanese stiltgrass. And every year, uh, even if you controlled all of the stiltgrass on your property, you're still gonna get a downstream influx of seed um, coming onto your land. So your strategy in that case might be that you are containing the stiltgrass to the bottoms and not allowing it to uh, creep up uh, beyond the floodplain, for example. And as we've said a little bit already, predict the response to your management and be prepared to do uh, some amount of follow-up treatments following um, management such as uh, timber harvest or forest stand improvement. And always be prepared to uh, adjust your plans as necessary. Um, so following cultural controls, we have uh, physical options. So this is pretty basic. We're talking about mowing, hand pulling, weed wrenching, such as the image there on the top left. Uh, that's a device that uh, you can use to, basically it's a large lever device that you can use to pull out uh, shrubs, in particular bush honeysuckle in uh, uh, looser soil because of its uh, shallow root system. That one is uh, very prone to, um, uh, pretty good for using that technique. Uh, also includes things like digging and string, string trimming and uh, can go all the way up to uh, forestry mowing, uh, which is uh, that machine there on the right, which can tackle uh, a large, uh, dense infestations of invasive shrubs and uh, do it probably more efficiently than just about any other uh, technique out there. But, you know, uh, there's differences here as well. So with the forestry mower, for example, you're you're removing the uh, above ground growth, but you still have the root to contend with and some follow-up treatment of some sort will be necessary because those are probably going to re-sprout once you remove those. Plus you're gonna have that disturbance event and so you're gonna have to be prepared to do uh, follow-up treatments for some time following uh, management of that sort. Uh, some biological controls, I just mentioned this because this is out there, but it's not something most landowners are going to be involved in. But this includes things like insects, such as the napweed, uh, root weevil there on the bottom left, uh, diseases such as fungal pathogens there in the uh, picture on the top and right. We have uh, uh, a couple different uh, fungal wilts. Uh, that impact a couple of different species. And then we have herbivores and grazers. Um, again, those are um, uh, things such as uh, grazers in particular are something that you're gonna want to do an additional treatment type. It's kind of similar to a fire or a forestry mower where you might top kill some of the um, target species, but you're probably going to need to do some follow-up control to re -sprouts. Another thing about goats um, is that they basically eat everything. <laughs> so um, if you have a higher quality community and you're just trying to get rid of some um, uh, light infestation, that might not be your best option. But if it, you have a heavier infestation or might be less accessible, um, that might be a good uh, possibility for you, it depends. Um, so some getting into the um, herbicide or chemical control, uh, some best management practices uh, that you could uh, do, just minimize the area that you're gonna be needing to use herbicides. For example, you could hand pull outliers that might be near desirable plants. So if you had any overspray, you wouldn't want to be killing uh, the desirable plants adjacent to them. Minimize your overspray. And I think I have another slide where I talk a little more about that. Reduce drift and volatilization. 
Uh, you can do that by um, increasing your droplet size or reducing the pressure that you have in your sprayer. So either one of those is going to make uh, larger droplets that are more likely um, or less likely to drift. Uh, volatilization, of course, is an issue um, with certain herbicides that um, uh, will uh, essentially evaporate into the air, especially in higher temperatures. So you do need to watch out for that with uh, certain herbicides. Um, using um, herbicides that are more specific, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Timing your herbicide treatments. So uh, one example of that might be uh, Japanese honeysuckle, which stays green much later in the season than most uh, native plants in this area. So towards the fall, um, you might be able to conduct a foliar application of uh, herbicide on Japanese honeysuckle and uh, without much risk of harming uh, the native um, plants that might be in the area. And use, using the least toxic options, I'm going to talk about a few of the most common uh, herbicides that we use uh, as land managers. So uh, I mentioned selectivity. Um, so more, most broadly, we have um, a couple of options for either grass-specific herbicides or broadly specific herbicides. And there are a couple of more recently developed uh, options that get even more specific. And those are oftentimes used in uh, prairie restoration, for example. Um, another one that's a little more specific is uh, uh, clopyrrolid, um, trade name Transline. Um, that one uh, we've used successfully in the past to treat uh, kudzu vine, which uh, is a legume and grows in tree canopies. So we don't want to harm the trees, but we want to take out the kudzu. So uh, that's been a, a very useful uh, tool for uh, control of that problematic invader. And we're going to get into a couple more of those uh, more details about those herbicides in a moment. Uh, really, uh, the, the best method or technique can vary, varies by target and the life stage. We always want to minimize non target impacts. Um, I mentioned reducing pressure, increasing droplet size. Another way to do that is using shields or barriers. Uh, this image on the left is a uh, a shield that was homemade that you can basically cut out a uh, old old bottle and uh, affix it to the end of your herbicide wand and direct your spray um, pretty much completely over the top of some smaller plants, which is pretty useful. I've had uh, some successes and failures with that, so you just kind of have to play around with it a bit. And then I also threw in the uh, paintballer here uh, for fun. Uh, I've never actually um, uh, been exposed to this technique, but apparently it is something that, that people do uh, in certain circumstances. So they have uh, paintballs uh, filled with herbicide. I guess in uh, areas where you might have difficulty accessing uh, the invaders, that might be pretty useful. Uh, spray on less windy days, but avoid spraying during an inversion uh, where the winds are completely still. You don't want to do that. And uh, timing, as I mentioned, for example, with the Japanese honeysuckle earlier. So uh, with foliar spraying, we're talking about a low percent solution, generally 1 to 5 percent. You do need actively growing vegetation. Um, and basically when we're conducting this type of treatment, we thoroughly wet all leaves to the point of runoff, but not beyond, which uh, can be difficult at times, but you do your best. Um, you want to take care to treat most of the leaves on a plant. So in a lot of cases, if you only um, 
are spraying and hitting about half of the leaves on a plant. And in most cases, uh, I would say that's not gonna be enough to actually kill the, the individual. So you wanna make sure you're getting most of the leaves. And uh, follow label restrictions for rain fastness. And uh, we, I threw in here as a rule of thumb, try, I try not to use foliar applications if, the rain, if there's rain predicted within 24 hours. But in some cases I've seen uh, some labels um, could be as little as an hour uh, to be rain fast, but you just need to watch that label. I did want to mention adjuvants or uh, additives that can improve efficacy of herbicides. And for example, we have uh, glyphosate can have issues when used with hard water and adding ammonium sulfate uh, can reduce some of those um, uh, issues. Or triclopyr, uh, non-ionic surfactant is recommended and the same is true with uh, clethodim. We have a whole suite of different types of sprayers, um, depending on uh, the size of your uh, issues that you're addressing, different species. Um, so what we're gonna get into here with the uh, cut stump, basal bark, and stem injection treatments. These are all, I kind of all lump these all together. Uh, these are generally woody species treatments. They could, this, uh, these methods can have fewer non-target effects because you're uh, basically applying the herbicide directly to a relatively small area. Um, it could be easier to miss applications of smaller stems. And this is typically working with a higher percent solution um, because you're uh, applying to such a small area. Uh, it does require a higher percent solution in order to do uh, the job. Uh, the timing varies uh, somewhat. You can do uh, most of these treatments pretty much any time of year, but we try to avoid uh, spring during leaf out uh, because some have found that that can be less effective. So the cut stump treatment, if you're not familiar, is basically you cut off a woody stem uh, pretty close to the ground and you treat the surface. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do it. You can use one of any of those sprayer options that we uh, showed a moment ago, or uh, I've seen some people use paintbrushes. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ways to go about it. Uh, so for stems under four inches, you wanna treat the entire cut area, but for larger stems, you only really have to treat the outer uh, part of the growing tree because that's going to pull the herbicide down into the root system and do its job. Uh, basal bark, you treat the entire circumference of the stem from a height of about uh, 15 inches down to the ground and that varies somewhat between herbicides. Uh, if there's multi-stem plant then you must treat all of the stems or uh, it will survive. And you wanna be careful not to use this in an area that uh, the stems might be coated in silt, for example, which is after a flood in a floodplain. It's gonna block the herbicide from uh, getting to the bark and absorb, uh, absorbing into the plant. Um, so this uh, hack and squirt drill and fill method is one that uh, I've only recently begun using, but I am, uh, kind of intrigued by it. Uh, the efficiency of this method uh, seems to me like you might be able to get a lot more work done than some other methods. Um, but we're testing the efficacy of uh, some different herbicides on some uh, smaller woody species here at the Egg Center to see how that would work. But basically you make a series of either hatchet cuts or um, you can use a drill in some cases, um, the herbicides that you would use for this type of treatment will vary. Um, and it, you can't use any, just any herbicide uh, for this particular treatment. You have to check the label, but there are uh, different versions of glyphosate and triclopyr and a few others um, that you can use for this method. Uh, 
So generally, uh, with herbicide properties, um, you strive to do the job with the smallest total negative impact to the environment. And I appreciated that quote from the uh, Nature Conservancy's uh, document on uh, invasive control some time ago. And some of the things you want to consider are effectiveness against the target selectivity, mechanisms of dissipation, behavior in the environment, toxicity, uh, some application considerations, and safety. One thing with herbicides we want to watch for are the signal words. So um, uh, danger is uh, sort of the most toxic or uh, the um, signal word that either is toxic or can, uh, can uh, cause eye or skin injuries. And then sort of the middle ground is the warning, uh, which is moderately toxic or can cause moderate eye and skin irritation. And then finally is the caution signal word, which is what we mostly try to use. Um, and that can, um, is only uh, slightly toxic or can cause slight eye and skin irritation. So uh, some of the most frequently used herbicides include glyphosate, triclopyr, and clefidem. Glyphosate is a broad spectrum, uh, non-selective herbicide, and there are a ton of different options available. Some of these are aquatic safe and some are not, so you want to be careful of that if you're uh, doing any work near uh, waterways. Uh, generally, it's believed that the surfactants in the non-aquatic safe glyphosate formulations are, are what's causing um, it to not be safe for aquatic species. So um, just make sure if you're doing those sorts of treatments, you have an aquatic safe option. Triclopyr, um, there are a couple of different um, formulations of triclopyr. Historically, it was only two formulations with the triethylamine salt and the, uh, the ester formulas, but they've come out with a couple of new ones, and I'm not really familiar with those, so uh, you do want to be careful. Triclopyr uh, 4 or the ester is um, only a caution, but the uh, 3A or amine version can cause severe eye damage. Uh, so you want to watch out for that, depending on which version you have or which target you have, which should be most effective. Um, it can be persistent in the environment as well, and uh, the ester formulation can be toxic to fish and invertebrates. Uh, clethodem is a grass-specific herbicide, which is becoming the more popular um, of the grass-specific herbicides. Uh, this one, again, has numerous trade names and formulations. Um, a small number of species, uh, they only have uh, data on a small number of species for the toxicity of this herbicide, but it is non relatively non-toxic uh, to, to people. And I realize now I am going uh, a fair amount over time, so I might uh, skip through some, some of this here. Um, but um, I just want to mention that the personal protective equipment uh, recommendations on the label are a legal requirement and typically consists of a long sleeve shirt, pants, chemical resistant gloves, and shoes plus socks. Uh, also, some also include eye protection, especially those that have um, more potential um, for eye damage, of course. A couple of things that I like to do to reduce um, exposure. Uh, don't make applications downwind. Using rubber boots instead of more absorbent uh, materials. Don't walk through a recently treated area. Consider using herbicide dye if you haven't done so in the past. I, I definitely recommend it. It's, it's great for seeing um, where you've sprayed already, uh, what you've treated already, but also for um, where you may have uh, gotten some on you and you need to, to wash it off. So the label is, as I mentioned, a legal document. So you do want to check these out. If you're going to be using herbicides, um, try to familiarize yourself with 
uh, the label of the product that you're going to be using. And I like to uh, get the uh, digital copy online at cdms.net and download it onto my phone. That way you open it up and you know you want some information about a particular um, aspect of that herbicide. You can just use the search feature and you don't necessarily have to dig through pages and pages uh, of the label. So just some examples of some of the types of information that you can find on the label. Uh, product rates, percentages, control recommendations for specific species and types of sites. And to close out, some more information. If you want to know more about uh, managing invasive plants, I highly recommend uh, the recent publication, the Management of Invasive Plants and Pests of Illinois. Uh, there front and center that has information about just a whole suite of uh, the species that you might encounter in Illinois and, and uh, best practices for managing. And I've included some links to those resources here. And with that, uh, I know I'm over time, but um, <laughs> I'm going to close it out. And I don't know if we want to take uh, a question or two. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> let's just uh, jump right into these questions. Um, so this first one is for Chris. Um, are many of the plants you mentioned in your presentation, or just invasives in general, allelopathic? Uh, that's a good question. Um, allelopathy is fairly common um, in plants in general. We're finding out more and more that that more plants have that ability to exude chemicals out of their roots that that help them along. Um, we are finding that many of those invasive plants do have some level of allelopathic property. So yeah, I think it's probably a little more common with invasives than in just plants in general. Okay. So either one of you could answer this one, but uh, I'll go ahead and ask it. Can you provide info on how landowners can get help managing invasives? Um, I'll start with that one, I guess, and Kevin can jump in. You know, a great place to go to start with that would be your uh, local extension office. So they would probably be familiar with um, who to contact, uh, what programs are available in your area. Another place to reach out to would be the NRCS office or the Soil and Water Conservation District office in your county. They are often the most familiar with um, local programs and, and can provide um, good contacts in your area for people to help with that. Okay, so <clears throat> Kevin, this one's for you. Um, one of our listeners wants to know about gout weed. How would you go about treating gout weed? Um, actually, I am not familiar with gout weed, so I have no idea. <laughs> Chris, do you know uh, that one? Um, that's not one that I dealt with much. Um, a great resource to look for plants that you, you uh, want to control would be um, a group called the Midwest Invasive Plant Networks, um, they have a control database. So MIPN, you can type in MIPN and then control database. And they handle a lot of those um, kind of upper Midwest invasive species. And I would imagine they have good information on gout weed. That would be the first place I would look. I haven't messed with that one either, so. Okay. So Chris, this one's for you. Uh, historically, did anyone in the past ask indigenous tribes about the use of invasives? Uh, it's a good question. You know, invasive species uh, as a concept is something that's actually somewhat relatively new. We really started using that term and understanding the implication of these non-native species and, and their impacts onto the, the landscape really in the last 50 or 60 years. So I would imagine, you know, the historical um, management of invasives wasn't really, at least in the United States, wasn't really something that uh, was done in the sense that we didn't have a lot of these invaders, um, you know, new coming in or, or the need to manage them. I think there's certainly been vegetation management for um, for as long as people's been around. 
um, in an area, but really kind of the true invasive management, um, at least in the United States, is a relatively new concept and a new thing that we're realizing is needed. Okay. And let's see. So Chris, can you recommend a resource or resources to help with the identification of invasive species in northern areas of Illinois? Yeah, you know, um, just as a, a preview, we're hoping to work something up and develop uh, a, a new guide for ID of all the invasive plants in Illinois and, and have published that through the Extension, uh, Extension Forestry Service, but um, that's not here yet. Uh, right now, I would look at um, either the Invasive Plant Atlas of Wisconsin or the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. Both of those have really good guides to uh, invasive plants um, and they both would cover um, all of those um, species, you know, that would be a problem in Northern Illinois. Okay, good deal. Uh, moving right along, uh, one of our listeners uh, commented that uh, bittersweet invaded in a two year period and silk grass invaded in only a year. Why the sudden impact? I assume he's talking about his, his own private land. Yeah, um, you know, I would say that there may have been some kind of change of happening, some disturbance or some impact that has facilitated um, that rapid change. You know, a lot of these species can double or triple their population um, within a year or two um, fairly easily given the right situation. So I, not knowing the history of that site, the first thing I would ask is what has changed management wise, what has changed in terms of uh, the way that that site looks um, in terms, you know, it could have been ice storms or something to facilitate that rapid change. All right, good deal. Well, that just about wraps up our questions. Um, first of all, I want to give a big thank you to uh, both of you gentlemen for coming out here to talk to us today. And, and I want to thank all the listeners for joining us for this session of our webinar series.